welcome to Season 2, Episode 2 of the Ubuntu UK Podcast. It's Monday the 13th of April and I'm Tony. With me this week are Alan. How are you doing, Al? Yeah, not bad, actually. Yeah, what, good to be back. What have you been up to the last couple of weeks? Uh, fixing a duff disc in my desktop. Another one? Well, yeah, I, I seem to get through them. A lot of disc-related issues in your house. Yes. Is it yes. because you live next to a giant magnet? No, it's. I think it's actually having two very small children. I blame them. I think they get up in the middle of the night and, and administer your systems. And RM, RF, my, my, my discs. Poke biscuits into your drobo. Actually, they did put crayons in my PC <laughs> once. That was the cause of one disc failure, was crayons in my disc. Excellent. And with so many discs running, you're bound to lose the odd ten or so, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And uh, how are you doing, Simon? Yeah, very well. What have you been up to the last couple of weeks? <sighs> G Podder is the main thing. Oh, Actually, yeah. in fact, no, it's not. Uh, G Podder, I found, I had not used it before. I've been using Mash Podder, which is a command line app f- for downloading. Mash Podder? Podcasts. Yeah. Came downloading from, podcasts about the Korean War. Uh, actually, other things. Oh, right. Okay. Now, um, G Podder and Drupal. Actually, okay. I've been working on Drupal a lot and getting that going. Uh, a new blog. Why, why are you using G Podder when you last week said you want to do everything without the mouse? Uh, good question, actually. No, <laughs> was, was this using... on your Crunchbang machine, or was this? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, interesting. So, what is it about G Podder that makes it so good? I don't know. Actually, it looks. It, I've got a GUI. I've been using the command line with Mash Podder. That's fine, and um, G Podder just has got looks nice. And Drupal for your website? Yeah. What What was the reason for that? I've never really... No, I have used it, but I've never administered it. Right. So i start with a vanilla installation and where can it go? And you're doing a multi-site thing. Or did you try and do that? Or I haven't. I've gone for just a base install and then I might multi-site later on. Maybe. We'll cool. see. Mm, okay, cool. See. Well, we've got an interview with Emma Jane Hogbin, who's a Drupal whiz, um, later in the show. So that kind of fits in with that. Um, Laura, who's sitting in for Dave this week, what have you been up to? I've been on holiday for about a week, so... Yay. Yay, excellent. (laughs) Yeah, the only uh, contact I've had with Ubuntu in the last couple of weeks really has been my Ubuntu travel adapter, um, which is great. You can get it from the Canonical shop. It's fantastic. It's a travel adapter. It's got Ubuntu printed on it. So did you take your travel adapter with you, Laura? I took my travel adapter... And Tony took his travel adapter. You have one each. <laughs> we have one each, yeah. His and the, hers travel adapters. Nice. The best thing about them is they've got a, a little USB module for them, mm. so you can charge USB devices. Is, one, your, is one male and one female? Uh, no. Oh, okay. Sadly. Um, but yeah, so you can li- pr- uh, charge your phone or your um, MP3, MP3 players, player. which is handy, because we didn't have a laptop to yeah. uh, but charge yeah. them. So that's no basically laptop. it. Cool. No, I know. No. I was very brave and wow. went, went without any He was of... going to take his ace as a spy. Yeah, the, uh, a spy one, yeah. Mm. So we're going to have an hour of podcast of you telling us about the Norwegian fjords. Yes. Yes. They're very rocky. Tune out now, listeners. Yeah. Press stop now. Okay, well, what have we actually got in the show this time? Well, the first chunk um, is called Watching Paint Dry, which okay. I know doesn't sound exciting. But it, it will be when we get to it. <laughs> we hope so. Next up, we're going to have an interview with Robbie from Category 5 TV. Yes. And um, we're going to discuss what's been happening in the Ubuntu ecosphere. Ecosphere? Yeah. Yes. I'm not quite sure what that is. Something okay. to do with Alan. All right, okay. Well, of course, we're going to cover the news and uh, other events that have been going on. We've got an interview, as Tony said, with Emma Jane Hogbin. And we've got your feedback. I mentioned earlier that I've got uh, a disk that failed in a desktop at home. And because I use Linux software RAID, I've been um, watching the RAID mirror rebuilding a lot. And there's a file called slash proc slash MD stat, which you can watch right. with a program called Watch. Oh. And it tells you how long it's got left until the RAID array is rebuilt. And I found myself watching this somewhat compulsively <laughs> over the last few days to the point where I actually, even though it says I've got 40 minutes left until the RAID array is finished, I still sit there and watch it. <laughs> and I wondered if you don't oh, go and make a cup of tea or anything. It's been a oh, bit. I do. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll go and make a cup of tea, but then I do come back to it. I won't go and do something else for forty minutes. I will actually waste my time staring at that rebuilding, even to the point where when the console um, screensaver kicks in and the screen goes black, I have to hit the control key to wake it up again so I can carry on watching it. <laughs> and I wondered if anyone else had this weird compulsive behaviour where they have to watch percentage things. I don't know. You've got to be pretty sad to make it match that. I think. Yeah, I guess. But I think we have some pretty sad listeners <laughs> in that regard. Okay. <laughs> Way to win them over, Laura. <laughs> so uh, you're going to have a long stint on this show. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I asked, what pointless progress or status screens do you watch obsessively? And uh, Colin McD says he watches the pre-scaling theme images quite a lot with Myth Bunty. Ah, that's probably not his fault. Ah, yes, yes. That, I know change that resolution, is. is that? Yeah, if you change yeah. resolution or change the theme, even by one pixel, it recalculates all the images and rescales them. There must be uh-huh. vector versions in there. And that can take a long time on a slower machine. Uh, Though, to be fair, it doesn't tell you how long it's going to take, so you, you can't really leave it. No, it's true. Is it one of those bars that goes across and then starts at the beginning? Yeah, yeah, really? yeah oh, several nice. times. Nice. I guess once for each image or something. Yeah. Uh, okay, <laughs> yeah, that's understandable. Uh, Mike Basinger said he stares at Conky sometimes. What's Conky? It's a sort of uh, graphical system usage meter. That's It's on open yeah, box, isn't it? it's on open box. It's, um, it's text as well. You can get it to update and you can get your what your process is doing your hard drive your swap space and everything's um, doing so you can sit and watch that and yeah i've been known to do that <laughs> yeah he likes to watch his memory and cpu usage yeah, for yeah, no yeah, good yeah. reason i've yeah, been there <laughs> it's just pointless <laughs> definitely gets a favorite of mine as well oh yeah oh yeah that gives you a time as well you still sit there and watch the next bar come across could you could you <laughs> what about um fsck you never Ooh. want to see those though do you i i, I find that boot. i don't want to watch that in case it's something horrible comes <laughs> up so the one thing that might actually be useful to you in terms of <laughs> the system you don't want no, to watch i'm in denial about those i don't want to see them right okay what else we got laura michael douglas what the, Not- the michael douglas <laughs> i don't think it's the michael douglas he says the longest one is windows installing mm. Ooh. 39 minutes remaining. He lies. Yeah. Completely lies. Sits on 39 minutes for about an hour and a half. Yes. Watching torrents download. It's like uh, normal downloads, but slower. That's sheep eating Taz on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, which is the torrent client that... It's a GUI torrent client. It shows you like a bitmap of the bits of the file it's got and the ones it hasn't got and the ones that are available but it hasn't yet downloaded. And that's great because you can see them changing colour as it works out which bits it can get and as it downloads them, they all go green. And you can get stuck there with one red pixel in the middle of it. <laughs> You've got it <laughs> bad. Yeah. I don't know, but on Windows, I used to, w- <laughs> I used to watch the disk frag. Um, the defragger. defragger. Excellent. Hugo said that, actually, the other day when I mentioned it to him. He said he used to watch the Windows defragger a lot. Yeah. Well, it doesn't really surprise me. Um, I, the, the things that I end up watching a lot of are encoding processes, uh, audio or video encoding stuff, and you sit there waiting for it to, to 21 seconds, 20 seconds, 25 seconds, and something <laughs> else kicks in. <laughs> Never really works uh, to time. But, uh, yeah, I spend quite a lot of time doing that. So there's a difference there, though, between having to watch something, like having to watch the prescaling thing on Myth 1, 2, mm. and actually choosing to watch yes. it because it's, the it's, colours are pretty you could, go, you could go away you could you could sell it's going to take at least an hour and go and do something useful and come back but no you spend an hour on on the computer watching it with one eye but sort of checking IRC checking your Twitter going on Facebook whatever it might be and just suddenly the hour's gone and you know you could have been spending time with real people in the real world but no we'd rather watch a ASCII status bar crawl slowly across our screens I am actually SSH to my machine at home we're at Tony's house and I've been SSH to my machine at home I am actually watching the md stat update now <laughs> while we talk yeah i can't how I can't far has it got it. I think he's got about 10 minutes left wow are you gonna run home at the end of the 10 minutes and <laughs> kill another disc with a crayon <laughs> <laughs> just so you can watch it again yeah yeah i'll get the kids to insert crayons into my machine has it changed uh yes uh, don't worry uh, I, I will keep everyone up to date apprised of the state of my disc resyncing that's the joy of doing this live. Almost. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Oh, it's moved. Yes, there we go. And the uh, the final comment we've had from Andy Lochran, who says um, that what he waits for is the next UUPC release. Oh, I think oh. it goes to the website hits F5. Yeah, <laughs> what a creep. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. I recently um, discovered, well, I say recently, a few months ago, discovered um, an online uh, TV show, if you like, uh, called Category 5. And uh, I got chatting to the guy who presents it, the main guy, and um, he really focuses a lot on Ubuntu. And so I thought it'd be good to get him on and have a chat to him about it. Okay. And he's on the line now, is that right? Yeah. Hey, how you doing? Hiya. And it's Robbie, is that correct? Yeah, Robbie Ferguson here. Robbie Ferguson. How are you doing? Great. How about you? Yeah, not too bad, not too bad. So tell us about Category 5. Why did you start it? Was that why? Yeah, why? Why? Well, um, 
you know what? To be honest with you, I, I ran a, an IT firm uh, up here in Canada. We're in Ontario, Canada, and uh, we saw a lot of, uh, just like any computer business, a lot of people wanting support for their computers, wanting to experiment with open source software, but not not trusting the fact that they don't necessarily have support for those pieces of software. Right. Uh, a lot of these people, though, wanted support for free, right? So the problem that we were running into as a company was that I wanted to be able to support these these things. I wanted to be able to uh, install Ubuntu Linux on somebody's computer and, and provide them with support, at least professional-level support, uh, but in such a way that they didn't have to pay for it or that we could do it in such a way that, uh, you know, they they could tap into a resource of uh, Ubuntu support or open-source support. So we started Category 5 as kind of like a TV show style podcast, if you will. We broadcast live. And uh, so that way, as those calls came in, I could start saying, just tune in on Tuesday nights. And you can probably hear my kids screaming like a monster in the background there. <laughs> Sorry, there's cats roaming around here. <laughs> <laughs> but we, uh, yeah, basically I started taking those calls and started saying, uh, every Tuesday night you can catch me at 7 o'clock our time. And uh, and then we started seeing local people tuning in to get support for these uh, open source uh, pieces of software. And then it transcended the, the software into using digital cameras, what's the best kind of printer to purchase, those kinds of things as well. So is it sort of tutorials that you do? We started out that way. Um, we started with PC Linux OS and looking at, uh, you know, various, you know, when Barrel Project was was the thing, uh, we were looking at, you know, how to install those things, how to make them work on your standard computer. Uh, but then we grew into, um, as the as the viewer base grew, we started getting a lot more emails. We started getting phone calls uh, during the broadcast and decided to actually take it one step further and turn it into like a call-in help show. So that's that's what it grew into. So people ask questions, and you 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 kind of have some cojones to to try and answer the. That's what they tell questions. me. <laughs> <laughs> to try and answer the questions there and then. I mean, that's that's some feat because sometimes people throw real curveball and tricky tricky questions. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've been doing it for like it's been eighty. We're in our eighty second week now. So uh, you know, as as you get into it after forty or so episodes, and they're one hour episodes, you you really start to get used to. Uh, having to be on your toes and and having to be on the ball and and you just can't be afraid to say you know what I I'm sorry I can't help you with that because I don't know um, if if you're if you're afraid to to admit that you don't know something then that's a, that's where you know it just doesn't work so totally but you also have like the forums to back that up as well don't you so if you yeah we do then you can yeah. forward them to the forums can't you. Yeah, our community has been growing. Uh, certainly, uh, the number of people who visit our website doesn't even doesn't even come close to the number of people who view the show, uh, and that's because we broadcast live through UStream. We broadcast, uh, uh, we simulcast after the fact with our podcasts uh, on various formats to Miro Internet TV and iTunes and RSS and XML and everything that you can you know get your hands on. So. Uh, so we have a lot more viewers than there are active people in the forums, but the forums have grown into a place where uh, viewers can kind of help people uh, kind of take it one step beyond the show and, and interact with the other viewers. So. so it sounds like you're a bit of a video and audio geek then. I started out, uh, well, I started doing internet-based uh, video production with real media uh, way back uh, when I was 16 or 17 years old. Uh, so we were creating, uh, this was a, a software project online, kind of one of the first pilot projects where we did a virtual tour of, you know, where you can point and click on various areas of a, of a theme park. So you're walking through the theme park, you know, using old school real media technology on dial up internet. So, wow. uh, so that has grown into, then I was working in radio for several years before I got into it support. And, uh, so this is my way of getting back into media as well. Yeah. So your your podcast now weighs in about 700 meg download for one episode, doesn't it? Or yeah, for the H.264 feed, uh, which is 480p, uh, and it's a one-hour broadcast, of course. So, uh, yeah, it's about 700 megs for the for the high resolution, like the 640 by 480. So that's quite a leap from dial-up real audio. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and just the interaction. I mean, we get calls and email, uh, people joining us in the chat room from all over the world. And you can see that even we've got over 100 uh, viewer testimonials on our website that uh, people just go onto the site and just tell us what they think of the show. And you can see each each week we get them just from all over the world. It's it's 
quite incredible that way so how do you put the show together have you got a a studio at home or do you uh, take over a spare bedroom or something like that well it sort of started as my uh, home office because i was self-employed and uh and so the home office was the starting point, and so we basically, when when I started this thing back in two, like late 2007, uh, it was just me and a webcam basically kind of thing. So then obviously we've grown since then, uh, and s- since then basically we've just turned the uh, basement of my house into a, a television studio, which is always growing and always changing. So yeah, you've got multiple. I, th- I see you've got multiple cameras, and you yeah. uh, you have the. Um, desktop that you switch to as well when you yeah we have a, an Ubuntu what we call a demo system so it's it's always running the the latest version of Ubuntu as far as the the actual releases go and then uh, and then we're able to switch from different camera angles to uh, a view of the desktop and we use Compass Fusion to be able to zoom in and out uh, so that people who are watching on low resolution feeds say 320 by 240 they're able to uh, see the things that are happening on the screen and it's it's been a really good tool for people to use uh, as a resource for learning how to use linux one of our listeners colin mccarthy has asked how on earth you find the time to do category category 5 tv he finds it's difficult to get the time to watch it never mind make the show (laughs) (laughs) Uh, that's that's true enough but uh, see the advantage when i started this thing is that i was like i said self-employed uh in this field right so uh so as we were starting it it was a part of my company so basically my company was the the grand sponsor if you will like we dedicated so much time per week to uh, preparing for the show and answering viewer questions and things. And then there's also the fact that because it's, you know, every Tuesday night, it's a set allocated time every week, uh, and we're faithful. We've never missed an episode in 82 weeks. Uh, Because of that, it becomes a part of your weekly routine, right? So So, so you said it's um, Tuesday night. When, When exactly does it air? Well, it's it's live. different for you, and Alan could tell you, uh, but it's <laughs> this whole time zone thing. Yeah, yeah, it's it's seven o'clock Eastern time uh, on a Tuesday night here. If you go to our website, Category Five TV, up in the top left, we always have uh, convert to your own time zone, so that will automatically figure out what time uh, the broadcast airs in your time zone as well. It's going to be about one or two in the morning, generally, though, isn't it? Yeah, it's about. Mi- it's I've about I've sat up till yeah. midnight and watched it, and. Uh, yeah, then but regretted it the next morning. But yeah. <laughs> but you can still get the get it as a download afterwards. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. A lot of users, uh, a lot of viewers are using Miro Internet TV. It's a a great open source package that uh, that. Uh, works on all platforms basically so uh, that's a great way to get it you can subscribe to our rss um, with any uh, feed aggregator so yeah we make it as as available as we possibly can because for us it's a free service right so for us it truly is about uh, the viewers and and answering viewer questions and making sure that it's accessible to the viewers Uh, even so much as we even convert the show into uh, audio only format and we have a podcast that's just an audio recording and mp3 format of the actual show Uh, so a lot of people listen to it in the car or if they've just got an mp3 player or whatever um, places where they can't view the show they just listen to it excellent robbie bearing in mind that's uh, 82 weeks now and uh, and the workload something that's dear to our heart Um, (laughs) why are you doing it uh grand you, picture why yeah, do i do why are you it? still yeah, doing you know what 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 is your motivation obviously you know you're providing a great service um what's your motivation behind you know all the effort that you're putting into the show mm-hmm. um I, honestly it's it's every single viewer um it's a very interactive show uh, i take i take uh, i think you'll you'll see if you watch the show that i really do my best to try to take the time uh for each person and i really want people who don't you know who maybe are intimidated by linux or who are intimidated by technology in general i want them to feel um that they've got somebody who's kind of an advocate for them somebody who's not out to take their money because we do this for free um is somebody who's able to answer their questions at a level that is on par with their with their where they're at with computers but at the same time it's not condescending so you know i really put an effort into helping helping the underdog if you will uh people who who really get taken advantage of in this field yeah sure too often so and i see that a lot because of the industry that i work in is you know a lot of uh you know computer retailers and things you get them they'll just sell you whatever the highest commission is yeah um so 
really it still is, you know, we want to be able to help people so that they make wise purchase decisions so that they know uh, that there's open source alternatives to commercial software. And, and I'll be honest with them, if, if I think that one particular piece of software is going to work better for them, I'm not afraid to say that. So, so it's not all about Ubuntu, but it does often come back to Ubuntu. And, <laughs> and uh, that seems to be my recommendation. That's good to hear. Great. Yeah. Good man. Yeah. The other thing you've been doing recently you, it was submitting an entry for the Free Culture Showcase for mm-hmm. the included content on the Ubuntu CDs for the next release for Jaunty. Um, mm-hmm. And you won, I believe, the yeah. uh, video category. Is that right? Yeah. How awesome is that? <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. So no you're... fault of my own. <laughs> I think it was, it was the night before the contest was about to end and I got a, a message on the IRC chat room for my show from Alan Pope and says have you got your have you got your entry in there for video yet and i it, honestly i think was the night before he had mentioned it to me before that but uh, i just hadn't gotten around to it and and in the back of my head i was like i really want to participate in this but uh, category five is a live show we're completely live completely uncut unedited unscripted so what can i do in a in the free culture showcase that is even partly reasonable you know like yeah. what can i give to that to that project so so i gave it a little bit of thought and uh and finally decided you know what i'm just going to be myself i'm just going to sit in front of the cameras and just uh say what i think about the ubuntu community and uh from my experience i mean i've i've i started out with lynn spire uh back in 2001 uh i've gone through many different distributions since then and and have settled on ubuntu so i know a little bit about how different communities react to uh to new users and things like that so i really wanted to stress that the Ubuntu community, from what I can see, is is really a, an exceptional community. Uh, a lot of people that just want to help. I mean, people like yourselves. I mean, why do you do this, right? We're just. It we is wanna, a good question. <laughs> yeah. Well, we want to. We. It's it's the spirit of community, and and that's kind of what I went with, and and uh, so I just said it like I felt it, and no script, threw it together and put it up, and I guess they decided that was uh, what they were looking for. Did you find it difficult to get a uh, an entry that was within the constraints of the competition because it's quite a small file size? Yeah, it was it? like I think it was like two two point five um, yeah, megabytes. Yeah, two and a half megs, something like that. Yeah. Which I mean, I haven't worked with a file that small since nineteen eighty two. You know, <laughs> like that wouldn't have even fit on a floppy disk. So, um, yeah, that was that was kind of something else. But I was working with Og Vorbis, so uh, unfortunately, because uh, because the file did have to be, I, I think it was either two point five or three point five megabytes. Uh, and I'm used to working within, you know, the gigabyte uh, range for our videos. Um, I had to take it back. So, you know, we scaled it down to 320 by 240 and things like that. So, but it worked out. And yeah. I think I hit it right on the button. <laughs> Excellent. Well, congratulations on your win for that competition. Yeah, and uh, it's going to be a bit bizarre, I suspect, seeing your own work on sort of millions of CDs as they get printed and duplicated yeah. around the world. I think if if you know if people actually go into the the folder and and bring that up and like we did it and I didn't mention the name of the show or anything in the video but I think people probably uh type it into their favorite search engines and stuff and come across our site and hopefully that'll lead to them uh getting some support from category 5. Okay, so where can people find out more about category 5? It's uh, just uh, right on our website category5.tv that's the number 5 just like the cable category5.tv. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, well, thank you for talking to us, Robbie. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Cheers, Robbie. All the best. Cheers. Right, we get through uh, loads and loads of uh, information when we're preparing for the show, Um, not all of which is uh, sort of newsworthy, but there's stacks of stuff going on in the Ubuntu ecosphere, as we've called it. We thought we'd cover some of those things um, right now. Yeah. Cool. Um, the first thing is that there's a new version of Ubuntu Tweak, which, am I right in thinking that's the cruft remover, as was? The, no. No? No. What is Ubuntu Tweak, then? Uh, it's a third-party thing, so it's not created by um, Canonical or, or an internal kind of project. It's a third-party app that you add on. Right. And um, if you think of, like, the Windows XP Tweak... Tweak UI. Tweak UI, that kind of thing. It does similar kind of stuff like that. It exposes settings that you wouldn't normally find buried somewhere. Mm. And it also does some things like allows you to <coughs> sorry biscuit <laughs> <laughs> biscuit attack a hobnob went down the wrong way um it allows you to do stuff like uh, uh install certain third-party apps right that aren't in the repository so it a few people have pointed out this a bit automatics like mm. which has made people a bit scary but it's actually really quite neat 
and, and the key thing is that in this new version they've added support for removing old kernels yeah it's something people, a lot of people ask for when you upgrade you end up with all these old kernels kicking yeah. around is it um, potentially dodgy can you do some um, some things that you really wouldn't want to do um well, I guess, you know, if you get rid of all your old kernels and your system no longer boots um, and you try and go back to one of the old kernels, then that, yeah, might be a degrade. But, you know, you actively have to, okay. you know, choose to do that. And it, it seems pretty mm. straightforward. And it also uses nice things like um, something called Policy Kit, I mm-hmm. think. I think it uses Policy Kit, which is a, a nice authentication frameworky thing so that it doesn't ask you for your pseudo password. It asks you for someone who has rights to do this kind of thing which is quite nice so it's foot more forward looking and not using kind of legacy ways of doing stuff it's quite nice i've never quite understood why there hasn't been some sort of automatic cleanup of old kernels in ubuntu anyway yeah i mean i know there are reasons for not removing a, a kernel as a fallback always having something that you can fall back on but if you've got a an, an installation that you've upgraded from release to release to release you can have you know 16 kernels particularly as there are kernel releases as bug fixes happen mm. within the release uh, life cycle for a particular release so it's worth installing just for that one feature alone <laughs> i tend to do it by aptitude um well, by searching well for, yeah but, for, but it's for a pain your average user you know absolutely who, who doesn't know aptitude doesn't know command line stuff it is a, it's got a nice front end to it it looks nice and but, it's pretty straightforward but is there some reason that i'm missing that there isn't an automatic cleanup of old kernels nobody's written it yet okay well if anybody's got any other reasons then uh, let us know by the usual routes next thing is that um Dr. Mo on the WordPress blog has talked about um, is Ubuntu, the Ubuntu manga, um, which is now translated into English. Now, yeah. I'm not a huge manga person, but it's sort of Japanese cartoon art, isn't it? Yeah, it's, there was this manga cartoon in, in Japanese, and it was to, it, the story is about three system admins who are um, trying to promote the use of Ubuntu. And um, it's, um, it, it's, a, it's an acquired taste, obviously, manga. I'm, I'm not a particular fan, mind you. I've never really gone out there looking for manga. So, but it's, it's, you know, another way of promoting Ubuntu in a different, to a different audience, really. Wasn't there something about people promoting Ubuntu in cartoon form in Africa as well? Oh, God, yeah. I vaguely remember that. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe it is a way of, you know, disseminating information without great big reams of text and CDs. I don't know. Google had a whole marketing campaign around a cartoon strip. That's true, yeah. Chrome, uh, Google Chrome. Chrome, yeah. Yeah. That was really, really well done with a multi million dollar <laughs> US company, <laughs> but with yeah, a couple of blokes doing a manga cartoon is a yeah. bit different. But yeah, it's, you know, more power to them. Yeah, absolutely. So presumably it was in Japanese first and they've now translated it to English. Yeah, the, um, the guys, we'll post a link in the show notes to all of these, but um, yeah, he uh, translated a lot of it to English. A few people got together and and the same person has also come up with the idea of a, of a GUI loco remote support tool thing. Yeah, I'm not sure whether he came up with the idea for it or um, whether it partially existed already. But, right, um, okay. Yeah, the idea is you have a remote support tool so you can you know, request support from someone in your local community uh, group and um, they can remotely control your machine via some secure method and to try and wrap that up in a nice application so it's not you know, having to SSH tunnel and run VNC and open ports and all that kind of horrible stuff that you have to do to remotely support someone. Because we talked all about various remote administration things during the last yeah. season, didn't we? And there were just option after option, hundreds of packages to do that sort of thing. Yeah, there are there are a few, but none of them are really as straightforward as he's trying to aim for. Something where you can just say, press a button and say, I need support. And there's a list of people who could support you that maybe have ratings next to them or people who've done this before okay. and have qualifications next to them or something. And, you know, you choose someone who's online, they press, yes, I'll help you. And, you know, it all just works. That's I think that's the target. And there are they, we have seen some of these, like the cross loop one we mentioned before mm. for Windows. Mm. But this one for Linux should be good. He's actually looking for funding, which is uh, an interesting thing. It's an open source community effort, but he's actually asking for donations which maybe maybe a bit twitchy initially what the donations would be for yeah i mean some projects have donate buttons on their websites don't they things on sourceforge and what have you um but yeah i can see why some people are uncomfortable with it mm. um it's not like well i don't know whether there's any cost involved other than getting coders to write the thing and convert the stuff well that's it maybe there's the sort of bounty idea you know sort of set some ideas up and um, get people to 
achieve those objectives. It's potentially a strong community builder if it's uh, building sort of trust and that among people who wouldn't ordinar- ordinarily get support from a community. Yeah, and helping direct people towards mm. you know people who are volunteering because I know there are there are people out there running Ubuntu who just don't know that we exist that us community people exist they're run, flying blind you know yeah so it's know. a really big thing mm. um, lots of people that do need the support it, hopefully it'll take off you mm. know trusted people that can essentially get into your system and and help you where you need it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, Alan was just having a phone call with his wife during a recording break trying to fix that a problem. And it'd be great to have had a button that she could just press and, and get remote support from somebody else in the loco when you're off recording podcasts. <laughs> I'm not sure I would like that. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, he likes to good. feel his wish. <laughs> yes. Well, also in the, in the spirit of giving, um, Phil Bull um, from the Ubuntu documentation team is uh, looking for help getting an Ubuntu installation guide together. Yes, he wants to get this done for 9.10 in time for Karmic. So not not within the next six months. What's Karmic? Good? Karmic Koala oh, is yeah. the nickname for 9.10. Yes, after Jaunty Jackalope, which is the next one, Karmic Koala. Um, yeah, he looked on the stats for the for the wiki, yep. uh, for the community wiki, and saw that of the top 20, seven of the top most access pages are to do with installing. So clearly there's a void there of... You know, people who are void of knowledge, in fact, of people who can't install it or have difficulty installing. What sort of things do they have difficulty with? Do you have you looked at them? I've looked at the the list. Yeah, mm-hmm. and the the top the top page on the community wiki is how to burn an ISO image. That old chestnut. Yeah, I remember posts to mailing lists about that from you know years ago, eight, yeah. nine, ten years ago, probably. Yeah, you know, people who have managed to copy the ISO onto a CD and have a beautiful file but <laughs> no way of booting it no yeah totally it. yeah it's yeah. That, i mean and there's, and there's others like you know how to actually install it um using the alternate cd how to install it from the live cd and all and all the options and yeah, it seems like a, an admirable goal to create an installation guide is he looking for community involvement yes yes absolutely he's um he's posted a message and created a specification on launchpad and there's a wiki page with details about what you know is planned to go in it I think he's looking for people to help out who can... I don't think you even need that much deeply technical skills. You just need to be able to you know, type stuff off in a in an office document. And um, and also proofread as well. You don't need to, mm. to be able to get into the technical side. Just proofreading. Somebody's got to do it. Yeah. Just and try the stuff out. Testing. All the tutorials and yeah. you know, any, any documentation that's in there that's got any you know, how-tos. Someone's will, got to test them. This will be a proper dead tree book. I don't know. Um, probably uh, a guide on on the website but i see no reason why it couldn't be converted into a pdf or something and then through lulu or one of those websites turn into a dead tree book cool okay um cory contrast from the artwork team and who also works on ubuntu studio who i think we interviewed again back we in did, yeah. series one at uds yeah. in prague um he suggested that all the artwork created for ubuntu should be crafted only using free software tools um which sparked off something of a uh, mildly heated discussion on the mailing the mailing list about it um and I think the conclusion was that there would be no sort of mandate on the tools that people use to uh, to generate their artworks and things. Um, but some guidelines towards using free file formats would be uh, created. Mm. Um, but it's a debate that's happened before, I think, around the Free Culture Showcase, um, where people were, you know, some people thought it should uh, have to use free software tools like the GIMP and all the sort of relevant uh, related products um, and only submit in free formats and what have you. And uh, I think this time around they, was, they had to submit in free format, but not necessarily create the the uh, artwork or whatever in a free a free software mm. package. I think I, I can see a valid argument. You know, if you're if you're creating a free software product, the content in that free software product should it have been created using that free software? Or is it about freedom of choice? Like these arty types, yeah. you know, they just want to get on with their getting on. It's arty not, types. <laughs> not necessarily down to the product that they use to make it, surely. But also, if the software isn't ready yet at a level where you can use it, then you're actually inhibiting people from doing things. Well, I think Corey's argument was the tools that we have available, like Inkscape, GIMP, and, and so on, actually are able to do stuff like create icons, create backdrops, you know, uh, coloured themes and stuff, all the kind of things that the artwork team do. The tools we have actually can do it. And that's been proved by, you know, he does it using free software tools. So, you know, 
I, I could see the argument, but I equally I can see the other side where they say, well, look, I already use this tool on a daily basis, and I know this tool. It's non-free. It uses non-free formats, but so long as I convert it to a format you can understand. Um, and also, if, okay. if you mandate the use of free software tools, then you're potentially um, cutting off a whole swathe of people who could be involved but mm-hmm. can't be because they're not familiar with those tools yeah. now you can try and help them to get the use of the new tools and to learn those packages and blah blah blah, blah but you're still reducing uh, effectively the, the number pool. of people who can yeah. get involved yeah totally and so the debate goes on <laughs> yes yeah. that's never ending yeah. That one. yeah well we just like to point out that we do use free software for making this podcast just to rub that in a little <laughs> bit <laughs> like uh the final one really is um Actually, it's all not. about. There's another one. Oh, is that all right, guys? <laughs> right. Well, uh, look, jaunty penultimate one. Oh, the penultimate <laughs> is the fact that jaunty is so fast to boot. Yeah, we had this debate about whether it was we worthwhile did. Fa- booting fast or not. I've noticed it, but I haven't got a stopwatch on it. But it's. I certainly don't need to go and make a brew now. Yeah, install boot chart. Install boot chart. Okay. And then every time you boot the machine, um, it creates a, a picture. In mm-hmm. some directory buried var log boot chart or something like that. Is it a free format? Uh, yeah. Excellent. Uh, dot ping PNG. <laughs> okay. And um, actually on Jaunty, it zips it up as well. It tar zips it because you end up with lots of them. Lots of free formats. And um, yeah, le- three formats, in three levels. Three free formats. And um, it creates a, f- a picture which is like a timeline of your boot process. And there's a graph at the top showing you CPU utilization and a graph underneath showing you IO, I think. And then as time progresses, you see all the processes that start up. And so you can see peaks and troughs where certain processes start and delays and stuff. And so I think they've used boot chart as a way to figure out what the delays are and, and squish that down a bit and make, but you can see how long your machine, t- without a stopwatch, right. you can see how long it takes because it tells you at the top how many seconds. Cool. George Castro, who posted a blog entry about it, said he got his in less than 10 seconds. Yeah, something like seven and a half seconds to wow. boot a machine. That's not enough time to even open the uh, tea caddy, is it? No. The, boil, the, kettle, the kettle wouldn't have boiled by then, would it? Um, and the last uh, thing that we were going to talk about was Rhythmbox, mm. the music player that everybody loves, the default music player in Ubuntu since well, day not, one. Not everybody loves it. I think you're fine. I think the fact is that everybody does love it. It's fantastic. And I'm sure no readers will um, email in and contradict me with that. Can I email in? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, me, me too, actually. But basically, the main developer has said... Phew, it's not worth it anymore i'm giving up i'm going home so he's not going to do any more development work on rhythm box it seems that way yeah so what happens then that's a good question it's for for ubuntu they don't take it lightly the switch from one app to another you know there's very Mm. few you know they've not they've not switched for example from evolution to thunderbird or they've not switched from firefox to epiphany you know there's some big apps that they haven't switched but i don't know of many apps that have Kind of development has stopped or you know I slowed i suppose in the spirit of freedom and open source somebody else could actually pick yeah. it up and crack on with it that's the if whole they point, wanted to it? yeah what was his reason for stopping um i don't know actually you can read it in the um in the link on the mailing list it was right. it's actually back in february this year but i think he he basically said it wasn't worth his while to carry on maybe because other um competing products out there do the same kind of thing and it's not worth him re-implementing all those mm. features in Rhythmbox when other tools do it. That's fair enough. Mm. Yeah. The death of an open source project. Well, is it dead? You know, it still compiles, still runs. He's still doing some bug fixes, you know. I guess the test is if anybody thinks it's worthwhile going in and taking it over from him. Yeah, or replacing it in, Ubuntu, in mm. Ubuntu's case. You know, yeah. the, the mm. dis- one of the, I mean, in the case of this one, Rhythmbox, there's been multiple discussions at UDSs in the past of replacing it with Banshee. And that comes up with some... Um, some heated debate as yes. well because it's a Banshee's a mono application oh. so some people don't like it despite the fact F-Spot and Tomboy are in Ubuntu and they're both mono and some they're people both are. ace and they're both really good Perfect. yeah but. okay well that about wraps up our tour of the Ubuntu ecosphere Steve McIntyre has been re-elected as the Debian project lead. Yeah, Steve's been really helpful, I think, in trying to smooth over relations with the Ubuntu um, communities, with the, de- the Debian developers. Yeah, he's a good guy, yeah. yeah. According to a recent survey, about 14% of enterprises 
already switching to another operating system. Of those, 27% are switching to Mac and 25% to Ubuntu. Wow. But that is a small fraction of a small fraction of a small fraction of people. It still comes down to about 3% of the total desktop market compared uh, uh, of people who are currently switching anyway. And the, <laughs> and the Mac and Ubuntu is equivalent, nearly. Microsoft have claimed that 96% of netbooks are sold with Windows and not Linux. And Chris Kenyon from Canonical, along with several other commentators, has debunked this as FUD, um, as Microsoft figures are apparently based on netbooks sold through PC stores in the US and don't include online sales like Dell, for example. Yeah. When you see that, that Microsoft claimed 96% of netbooks are sold with Windows, and you just look at all the EPCs that have been sold. Statistics with prove Linux. what you want them to prove. Well, yeah, 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 that's true. Yeah, people believe them sometimes. Meh. The BBC have launched R&D TV, which is a monthly technology programme made up of interviews from knowledgeable BBC developers, BBC project ed- experts and experts from around the world. The good news is that it's available in freedom-loving Gog Vorbis Theora format. And it's torrentable. Is it any good? Mm. I've not watched it. No, ah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, it's good they're doing the right thing with some content available in an open format and... Yeah, you know. sort of crib this from the BBC website. Uh, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think they would put freedom-loving OG format. Though. <laughs> right, for those of you that uh, just can't stand to leave the blue screen of death behind, you can now try the portable Ubuntu project, an Ubuntu system running as a Windows application. It uses the Colinux kernel and provides an X server and even pulse audio. <laughs> Excellent for it's all of your audio crashing goodness on oh, Windows. No, no, because the Pulse Audio server is running on Windows, not on the. Is, um, it, is it better on Windows? I don't know, but I mean, don't it's actually that. quite good. It, you you end up with a your Windows toolbar at the bottom, and you end up with an Ubuntu toolbar at the top, and you can start Ubuntu applications and run them side by side on Windows. So let me get straight: you could now do things like running Firefox on Windows and, and Open Office on Windows. This is insanity. It's a world I never dreamed would exist. <laughs> <laughs> OpenMoco have discontinued development of the GTA 03 phone, the replacement for the free runner. The company are planning to work on Plan B device, which will hopefully generate revenue for them to revive the GTA 03 again. Apparently they've made quite a few redundancies as well. They sort of slashed the size of the company, oh, according really? to some of the articles. Yeah, oh, no. Sad stuff. Yeah. I wonder if Andor- Android has anything to do with this. What's no, the GTA R3 think. like compared with the original? It's, it doesn't, it doesn't exist. exist. It just There's never no, got very far. Not no. off the planning board, I don't think. Mm. But this new Plan B thing, the CEO was waving around, you know, this is what it will be like, and nobody really knows what it is yet. Wait and see. Mm. Debian has started developing a version based on the FreeBSD kernel, known as GNU slash K FreeBSD. Um, Catchy. Yeah, I still... I still bet it gets released before the GNU slash herd does, though. Ooh, meow. In a surprising move, Novell have dusted off the source for iFolder, the file synchronization and collaboration platform. They've promised to do it right this time, focusing on building an active community around it. Do you think this is in response to competition from Dropbox? Alan, what do you think? <laughs> I would love to see iFolder work. I would love to throw away Dropbox and use iFolder instead. I would love to. I tried to install it when it was sort of being neglected and, and there were some very dodgy Ubuntu packages that didn't quite work. Loads of people have tried packaging yeah. iFolder. It's one of those things that it's it's like entering the gang. You have to try it. I think then... essentially you need to package OpenSUSE for Ubuntu first. <laughs> <laughs> In news sure to please Cubists, Sun has released version 2.2 of VirtualBox, the desktop virtualization software, which now supports 3D acceleration in Linux guests. This is really cool. Oh, good. No, but, well, if you want to do, like, the funky effects and get the, the full effect of the new notification thing in Jaunty, where you get the fading and all that malarkey, if you're running Linux in a guest, of course. I'd rather a full USB support. Well, you can get full USB support if you download the version from Sun. The non-free version. Nah. We've got some um, events to remind you of. We mentioned last week the release parties. There's an extra one now. So we've actually got three UK uh, release parties. That's really good. Yeah, it's not bad, is it? Although not uh, quite the same as Lithuania. We've got six <laughs> release parties. <laughs> 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 There's not much, not much to do in Lithuania, clearly. <laughs> 
Yes, I think there's one in every bar in one city. Or... <laughs> no, they're all in different cities. They're all sitting on their own in that bar. <laughs> oh. So the three uh, we've got, one in London at the Warwick Bar. Uh, there's one in Manchester at the BBC in Oxford Road. And that's in the northwest of England. Yes, I mistakenly put that it was in the Midlands, but it's in the northwest. Northwest Manchester is in the northwest, and I will get that. <laughs> and you have to pre-register to go to that one. You do. You can either... Um, there's a... There's a link we'll put, but uh, you can either sign up by um, mailing someone or you can say you're going to arrive via the Facebook group or something like that. Okay. And the third one is uh, in Cardiff, which is actually it's going to be at two venues because they realise that some people are not old enough to go to a bar uh, or they're not happy with a you know, bar atmosphere. So um, it's going to start off before 7 o'clock in the evening. It's going to be at Starbucks in Cardiff. And then after that, it's going to be at the central bar in Cardiff. Details on the website. It's a nice idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's very inclusive. A good yeah. idea. And the next round of Ubuntu Open Week will take place from Monday the 27th of April to Friday the 1st of May. There's no sessions confirmed yet, but suggestions should go to George Castro, and we'll put a link in the show notes where you can find out details about yeah, that. Yeah, there's, there's a kind of hidden version of the calendar you can see that's um, filling up a already. A secret version. It's not that secret. You just go to the webpage and put slash prep in front of it, and you'll see... And June 13th, 2009, sees the Southeast USA Linux Fest. We played the uh, promo for that last week, I think, didn't we? Yeah. yeah. On the way back from Fosdem, Tony and I talked to Emma Jane Hogbin in the um, corridor of the Eurostar train. <laughs> with Perfect ra- recording environment. <laughs> yeah, random waiters and waitresses wandering past every so often looking at us <laughs> strangely. Mm. Um, Emma Jane is uh, she's a woman in open source and does present. She did a presentation at Fosdem about that. Um, she, as her day job, uh, consults on Drupal and sets up websites for people. I think she used to develop something of Drupal, um, and she's just about to release a book on it. And she's involved with the Linux uh, Linux documentation project and Ubuntu. Yeah, and she's an Ubuntu member as well. She is. Laura and I are here on the Eurostar, which is why you can hear all the rattling and background noise. Um, we're here with Emma Jane Hogbin, and we just come back from Fosdem. It was your first Hos- uh, Fosdem, wasn't it? It was my first Fosdem, yes. And how did you find it? Um, it was an absolute amazing racket of excitement (laughs) Um, it certainly is like no other conference that I've ever been to in terms of the self-directed developer rooms development rooms and it was it was pretty neat to go Um, and certainly Brussels is a pretty amazing city to be in as well and you got to a lot of conferences in a lot of places I believe yeah (laughs) Um, this is my first out of three conferences over the next five weeks I bet most of them won't have their own fish and chip van. <laughs> Sorry, chip van just outside the main door there. It's true, yeah. Although the queue was impressive for the chip van. <laughs> so what were you doing here at Fosdem? Uh, I was presenting in the Drupal developer room, and my talk was on uh, using Drupal to host multiple clients from the same code base. Because as well as doing Ubuntu stuff and being an Ubuntu member, you also do Drupal consultancy, essentially. Yes. Um, most of my paid work is with Drupal. Um, certainly, I'm very active in the Ubuntu community, but it's more on the advocacy side as opposed to the code contributing side. So what were you showing them in terms of multi-site? Um, I have a small business network with Drupal that has hosts about 20 different clients, and it's a single code base which allows me to host um, an evening where people all get together and learn how to update their sites and I know that it's going to be identical in terms of their experience because it's an identical code base. So what is it about Drupal that makes it so suitable for that sort of thing? Mostly because I've been using it for a while and so I'm familiar with it. Uh, One of the people in the presentation today was mentioning that WordPress does have similar functionality with their multi-site and allows a a stronger administrative capability over multiple websites. It's just a different way of doing it. So how did your talk go down? I I think the talk went really well. Um, One of the really neat things about Drupal is that um, really my talk had about five minutes of content and about 40 minutes of entertainment. So it, it really 
if you have one specific thing that you know you need to accomplish, it can be very easy to explain that one thing. The trick is knowing that that one thing exists. Drupal has over four or close to 4,000 modules that you can drop into the core to extend and offer new functionality and that sort of thing. And the hard part is knowing which of those 4,000 modules to use and knowing how you want to set up the core to be able to plug into those different things. Outside of your talk, were you spending most of your time in the Drupal room or, or elsewhere? What sort of other things did you see? Uh, I went to two Postgres talks, a lightning talk on Bazaar, did some socializing. Um, that's kind of like a session that you have to plan for, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's an important part of the weekend. It's all, it's all about the beer yeah. and the curry, and the curry. <laughs> when it arrives eventually. Um, you're a bit of a bizarre fan, aren't you? I am a, I am a bizarre fan, yeah. I find the, um, the code base is decent, and that's good. But ultimately, for me, it's the support that I get from the community. And I've never once, even though I have very, very basic questions, I've never once been uh, told to do anything more than go and improve the documentation. I've never been told to go and read the documentation. <laughs> so <laughs> I like that part of it. <laughs> so what do you use Bazaar for, for your own Drupal... Uh, code and, uh, yeah. and changes. So even with the uh, the multi-site, I still have themes that are deployed for each of the clients, and I use Bazaar to track changes so that when a client says, oh no, no, I liked version whatever it was ago, it's really easy for me to roll back and to check what those changes were. Okay, um, and now you're an Ubuntu member. I am. Um, and when did you become an Ubuntu member? Uh, I think last summer is when I first became an Ubuntu member. Uh, and why Ubuntu? Well, I've used Debian-based systems since 2002, I think, um, and went from Debian to Mepis, I think it's pronounced, to Ubuntu. And ultimately, for me, it was the easiest one to update and the easiest one to, to keep maintained. Um, my upgrades have been fairly painless in terms of going from whether it's 804 to 810 or you know, whatever that upgrade path happened to be. And again, I've generally found the <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I've generally found the community to be very supportive, which is always good. So, do you use it on servers as well as the desktop? Uh, servers are Debian based, not Ubuntu, and I'm using uh, exclusively Ubuntu on the desktop. So, well, why did you want to become a member rather than just using Ubuntu and you know, filing bugs or whatever? <laughs> um, I have been doing a lot of advocacy and I think it's it's important for people to see that there are ways to contribute and become a member that have absolutely nothing to do with code. Especially as a woman in open source, I think that it is important to uh, step up to the plate and be a role model when you're in a position to do so. You are a woman and you do... <laughs> it's true. <laughs> you are in open source. <laughs> yeah, and you are in open source. But you've two been two. given a series of talks on women in open source, uh, especially last year. Um, what really motivated you to do that? My frustration with a number of the, the women projects is really what motivated me to do it. Because I felt that the way that it's been uh, delivered in the past has been to blame men or to blame the project the way it exists right now and it really hasn't moved us forward at all and I think that the presentation that I delivered last year um, was really about saying if it's important to have women involved in open source then we need to figure out how to do that but bashing men is not the way to go about it. Did the talk have a, an impact that you noticed? Not really. <laughs> um, I found that it was more preaching to the converted. So those who came to hear the message already knew that it was important. They knew the tools that I was presenting in terms of alternatives. Um, I think it reached a new audience. It certainly, uh, after the presentation at OSCON, it received slideshow of the day on slideshare.net, which is cool. But other than encourage people to stay sort of on track, I don't know that it changed anyone's way of thinking. It just supported what people already felt. So what do you think is the next step towards sort of strengthening inclusivity or making sure people don't feel alienated from community? The really bizarre thing for me is that um, women tend to cluster. So as a woman in open source, I am constantly surrounded by women in open source. 
And I really don't notice the gender gap as strongly as some of the men do in the project, although certainly since my profile has been raised over the last six months, I've gotten a lot more um, personal messages or, you know, whether they're private emails or Twitters or that sort of thing, sorry, I dense, or dense, <laughs> uh, where guys are leaving comments that they would just absolutely never leave for other men. So it's it's interesting that the it, talk... Sorry, in, in, in what way? What sort of comments? Oh, um... I mean, ne negative comments or positive? The equivalent of drunk dialing, basically, where a guy is filling out a form and really, like, in one case, literally had had too much to drink and thought that it was a good idea. And, you know, my approach to it is to email them back and say, that wasn't very appropriate. And I almost always get a response back going, wow, I was not sober when I did that. I am so sorry. <laughs> you clearly need the Google thing where you have to type in a, a sum before exactly. you can uh, send an email. <laughs> But, I mean, I guess there are idiots in all walks of life. Absolutely. And it's not special to open source. Absolutely not. We don't get to claim this as our own. And that's where um, the Ubuntu project for me is especially interesting because the marketing material is certainly very female positive, but the community structure has a lot of competition built into it. Um, so the Karma points on Launchpad, for example, that's very different from the Drupal community where there's no tallying of scores. It's just a very, very different structure. And so I'm, I'm fascinated to see how these two communities progress. Um, in the Drupal community, the co-core maintainer is Angie Byron. The head of the documentation project is uh, Addison Berry. So there's a lot of very high profile women and we don't see the same thing in Ubuntu. You're involved with a lot of non-geeky um, <laughs> communities as well, aren't you? Like crafts things. How do you see those as different? Are they different at all? Uh, well, I would say that knitting is very geeky. <laughs> okay, um, computing. <laughs> yeah, and in that respect, it's very interesting to see that ultimately these are people who are um, completely topic focused. There's absolutely no reason why there's not more men involved in the craft communities. And yet here are these two uber nerd things that are completely opposite and there's not there's not a gender balance in either one of them and I don't other than sort of the school training of you know girls do crafts and boys do wood shop I'm not sure I'm not sure why that still exists my perception of going to various conferences and events over the last couple of years is that there have been a steadily increasing but perhaps slowly increasing number of women there mm -hmm. does that seem to tally with yours um certainly the jokes in the the toilets because that's where you know women tend to congregate is <laughs> that we now have to queue for the toilets which is certainly a step forward but the queues aren't out the door so really we have a ways to go yet <laughs> you see i would hate that if, if i was a woman that would have me excluding women on every possible ground i'd hate to queue for anything and for the toilet what could be worse <laughs> But last year at Fosdem, the uh, men's toilets were with the men and the women's toilets were with the women and men. Yeah. So it's sure that what the disproportionate numbers were. And we didn't have that this year. And at OSCON, certainly last year, the running joke is we were all going to have name plaques for next year because we did all have our own private stalls. <laughs> so it's not perfect by any stretch. <laughs> You're also working on a book. I think it's a Drupal book, is it? Right? Yes, uh, Front End Drupal. It's coming out in April, assuming I meet all of my deadlines. <laughs> And it's a book on Drupal theming, so how to create the templates that alter the design of Drupal. So you can take um, a stock Drupal site and theme it up so it'll look totally different from the stock. I can make Drupal look as ugly or as pretty as a graphic designer is able to imagine. <laughs> okay, so will it help people do the graphic design bit, or is it about the coding the design into Drupal language? It really is the in-between step in terms of the graphic designer uh, whether that also includes an interaction design component as well and the module developer there's a there's a slice in between and we're referred to as themers and themers are not necessarily um, capable of developing beautiful <laughs> but we can speak both languages so it, we're comfortable working in module land and comfortable working in graphic design land but it's how those two things get combined and put into a style guide that gets applied across the site 
And you mentioned earlier that there are a lot more books about Drupal coming out at the moment. There seems to be a spate of them. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Uh, because Dries, the project lead, said that he wanted more books about Drupal. <laughs> All right. And what he says goes. Absolutely. <laughs> Do you think Drupal has really reached a level of acceptance now that it perhaps didn't have a few years ago um, in the same way that, say, Joomla or WordPress have? The the interesting thing about Drupal, I think, is that um, at the DrupalCon, at the main conference, the, part, the core developers have asked that we stop calling it a content management system and start calling it a content management framework. So it really, at its core, isn't very sexy, isn't very attractive, but when you start plugging in one of those almost 4,000 modules, then you really can develop very sophisticated sites. And its focus is on, well, one of its focuses is on a community user-generated content, and it does that very well. And there are some, some very large corporate names behind it now. So uh, Sony, for example, has paid for a lot of development work, which all goes back into the community under GPL licenses. So there's some really interesting relationships between those who want things developed and the community who sort of contribute for fun. And with four thousand, yeah. well, fun and profit. <laughs> with four thousand modules out there, as you say, there's going to be pretty much everything you can think of has going to be done by somebody. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any sort of? Um, times where you've been stumped and you haven't been able to find something that's in a module when a client said to you, can you do this? Yeah, web scheduling, which is really, really hard to do. Um, and that's, people t- still tend to plug in the Google Calendar because web scheduling is, or web-based scheduling is really, really hard to do. And even if you look at Google Calendar, as good as it is, you're still limited to, I think it's half hour increments. So if you have a meeting that starts at 2.15, it's not immediately obvious how you would schedule that because it's it's hard Cafe Ninja emailed in to say that Easy Peasy was originally called Ubuntu E not uh, Ubuntu oh, we were talking about this in the last episode weren't we yeah. trying to remember what it was called Yeah, Ubuntu is a separate distro still going strong which he prefers the default config for Ubuntu works on his E701 out of the box that's what you've got isn't it are you using it yeah no, yeah. I'm not. I did, but then I went to crunch back. No, I mean, you've got 701. Yes. Ah, good, cool. Alistair McKinley emailed to say that our news article about Tux being replaced with Tuz made him panic. Uh, we should have mentioned it was only for one release cycle. Uh, we did actually mention that in our news article, but Alistair was clearly in such a panic that he missed it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bless. <laughs> Michael Mayer mentions that our podcast causes his Sansa E200 MP3 player to crash. Has anyone else had this problem? I, I don't know anyone with one of those players. No, email in if you have had. Or send us your Sansa E. <laughs> yes, we can test it. Yes. It could be something to do with the variable bit rate, I guess. Yeah, maybe. Don't <laughs> you yeah. don't really care. Do well, if somebody it? sends me one in, I'll, I'll have a look and I'll fix right. it. Good. Um, the Daily Telegraph technology correspondent, Dan Monsuela, um, wrote a very nice p- preview of Jaunty Jackalope on his blog on the Daily Telegraph website, in which he happened to link to an interesting podcast. Why, which podcast would that be? I'll give you three guesses as to which podcast he might have said was an interesting podcast. <laughs> um, yes, it was us. Um, so thank you for that that link, Dan. Um, and uh, yeah, it was great to see. It was a really good, interesting write-up of, the, of Jaunty and all the things it's offering, really, actually, for Excellent. new users. Cool. Okay, Twitter IDs are made to be read, not spoken. <laughs> <laughs> we have at B to Ripbridge um, says, though it's a contradiction in terms, what do you think is the best beginner's guide to Linux command line? Oh, the new one from the FSF and Floss Manuals. Yeah. Flossmanuals.org, Org? I guess. Google.co.uk. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Floss Manuals. Floss Manuals command line guide, yes. Yeah, that should be We mentioned really it good. last week, I think. Yeah. So check in the show notes for the last episode. It's probably in there. As Adam has a panic <laughs> look on his Check face. the website. Another one from uh, Twitter, at Apache UK, um, asked, what episode of Net at Night do you guys appear on? That's a very fine question, and uh, one which we don't have an answer for. Pope is Googling like mad. Yeah. We'll come back to that one. How's, how's about that? Um, Simon Weirs uh, suggests that we should talk about ways to get involved in the community, and that back in September he was trying to get into the community spirit a bit and wasn't too sure on how to get started in helping people now he posts on the forums he is a regular on irc um, when he gets some free time but he'd really like some uh, tips and tricks to help other people 
getting involved in the community um, and he really liked that idea it's something that sounds actually quite interesting to do because it we're all kind of community guys rather than developers in this room um but it can be a tricky thing to get you find your feet in really and get established as part of a community there is actually a page on the ubuntu website if you if you just go to ubuntu.com there is i can't see my screen <laughs> alan's pop shield covers his face <laughs> uh ubuntu.com uh on the left hand side there's a there's actually a link that says get involved and uh, if you click that there's a whole array of stuff uh showing how you could contribute to ubuntu including de- the usual development and that kind of stuff but there's also writing documentation and proofreading and giving support testing and you know, all the other kind of stuff all listed with links to various places on how to contribute but yeah maybe we should is that a community or is that getting involved i mean they're two different things aren't they I mean, it's- it, yeah it's how it's a bit like getting involved in a lug you know how do you get involved in that and how do you go to a meeting and not just feel like a bit of an outsider i guess you know mm. that, that's what i would suggest if you want to get involved in the community really you've got to go and meet people Mm. Um, and going to a lug is certainly that's how I started. Yeah, yeah, it's a good way to meet people. Cool. Okay. Well, hopefully those tips are some pointers in the right direction, and maybe we can talk about it a bit more in a future episode. And in reference to your previous question about go, go. Um, <laughs> which episode of Net at Night, it was seventy six. Excellent. Which aired on the twenty seventh of the eleventh of eight. Excellent. <laughs> well done. Thank you. Paul Hurst quite quite likes the sound of the update changes in Jaunty. Um, this was to do with the pop-up bubble things um, and hiding the update. Oh, notification. And yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but he suggests it might be nice if Ubuntu had an apply updates and shutdown option. This actually works quite well in Microsoft land and keeps people well patched with little interference in their daily desktop use. Of course, this only works for people who regularly shut down the machines, but it would be nice touch. I don't know. I, if on a Windows, on an XP, I've got an XP virtual machine, and if I shut it down, and I see that it says turn off or click here if you want to turn it off without installing updates, I always do that. I will never press the turn it off and do the updates. I don't know why. I, I don't trust it. I'd probably only do it for a desktop machine that I was leaving because yeah. if I'm turning off a laptop, it's because I want to unplug it. Yeah. Oh, I've I've worked in offices where someone's been standing around with a laptop swearing at it getting it mm. wanting it to finish doing the updates i mean it's their their own fault for pressing the do updates on shutdown but yeah i'm, I'm not sure I mean, if it was an option it'd be an option that'd be yeah, a good idea i think it yeah. would be a good idea it's right cool. about about uh, about the new format um phil newber just finished listening to the uh the new uh, episode or our last episode and the new format apparently is pure quality oh what a nice excellent man. thanks phil that's only because we said nice things about crunch bang <laughs> <laughs> simon did <laughs> well, I've not used it. I'm sure it's fantastic. Oh, I can't pronounce that. Chris Guvaras, Guvaras, and Jim Kerwin, welcome us back, and we've been missed. Apparently, <laughs> they appreciate the time and hard work um, to keep at it, and appreciating us keeping at it. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Maybe I should proofread these. Yeah. We need uh, community members to join our podcast and proofread the stuff <laughs> before I read it and sound like an just, idiot. <laughs> just need our technical writer to proofread it. <laughs> yeah. What's your job, Laura? I think I kind of combined two tweets right. into one. Basically, the they're the appreciative thing. of our hard work and want us to keep at it, I think is the gist of what yeah. they're after. That's basically yeah. it. Well, thanks, guys. It's a nice sentiment. Um, James Eaton didn't spot any difference between the quote-unquote pre-recorded shows and the quote-unquote live shows. <laughs> <laughs> I think he might do this episode. Uh, yes, I reckon. A few more fluffs this week than yeah. usual. And Colin McCarthy asks, have you ever thought of using Ustream.com and doing a UUPC live? We did, didn't we? Before we, yep. before we start recording this series, mm. this season... We talked at length about doing We had this. a big curry, and we talked about all sorts of wacky, crazy ideas about, about doing a, a live stream version. It, it, we, I kind of quite like to still, actually. Mm. Um, but, you know, if people are interested in us doing it, let us know, and we'll uh, consider it. Once we get a little bit better at doing it this way, then we maybe we can just look at doing a live stream. But we'll, we'll see. We'll, and when we get some bandwidth as well. <laughs> 1.5 megabit now, I'm at. Wow. Oh, well, upstream. Know. Uh, yeah, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <clears throat> that, that's one of the problems we have. Is there? There are technical issues, and then there are also every so often we like a tea break. Yeah, that's and, true. You know, biscuits. That's what interviews are for. 
Pre-recorded oh, interviews. Take, play, oh, I play out a 15-minute interview. Interviews. I thought you meant we all go for a tea break <laughs> while we're interviewing someone. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> Guest slot. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you for all your feedback, and we'll have some more next time. So that's it. Thanks for listening, and thanks to everyone who took part via Twitter and Identica. If you'd like to get hold of us, you can email the show via podcast at ubuntu-uk.org or leave 30 seconds of voicemail on 0845 508 1986. You can send us your comments on Identica via identity.ca slash UPC or Twitter, which is twitter.com slash UUPC. Alternatively, if you're into IRC, you can chat to us via the hash ubuntu-uk channel on the Freenode IRC network. And you can find us on Facebook. Search for Ubuntu UK Podcast. We welcome suggestions, material, tips, reviews or rants and feedback, both positive and negative, so please do get in touch. Thanks also to our network of community mirrors, uh, which we've listed on the website. Well, we said we would, but we haven't yet. Dave said he would. Okay, we will. We will get it done. (laughs) That's all for this episode. See you next time. Bye-bye. See ya.